And that is key, isn't it? He lives. We do not worship a dead Messiah. We worship a living Messiah. One who came back from the dead. And that is so important to know. It was not the fact that the Messiah came. It wasn't the fact that there was a great teacher. It wasn't the fact that there was a great wonder miracle worker in the midst of, of the people in the first century that established the church. It's the fact that he came back. He held true to his promise. He said, you tear this temple down in three days, I'll raise it up again. And he did, speaking of himself. And he rose in that grave. And he gives us the promise. This life is not all there is. Amen? Amen. God has sent us on a mission. He sent us to be light and salt to a world that needs it desperately. And he's called us to be his representatives and his hands and feet to the world. And so we've been looking at the beginning of the church and how this happened, this unstoppable force that just couldn't be quenched as it moved and it changed the world. I was reading a book a while back, talking about leadership, and the, the question was asked, who do you think was the most, who was the greatest leader in the world? And, and this man fired back, no question, it was Jesus Christ. The people around said, Jesus, great leader. He said, when you think about leadership in the sphere of influence, what kind of influence does a person have? There's been nobody greater than Jesus Christ. He has turned the world upside down. We're still influenced by him today. A couple thousand years after his death, Jesus touched people with his life and with his promise. And he speaks to those people in the first century and he speaks to us today. So as we look, especially in the chapter 5 of Acts today, if you have your Bibles, open that up. We see God at work. We see the acts of the Holy Spirit as the people remembered the promise that Jesus gave to us. Let's look at this. We've been looking at this amazing response to the gospel. On the day of Pentecost, when, the, when Peter stood up, all the disciples stood up, and they started speaking the word of God. Now, it was miraculous because everybody heard it in their native tongue. But the message they heard was powerful. God kept his promise. God promised you a Messiah. He brought the Messiah. You killed him, but God raised him up. And the people were touched. They were cut to the heart. You're right. We messed up we've missed the opportunity we actually killed the son of god what do we do with that and peter said here's the deal god sent him for your sake he didn't send him to judge you he sent him to save you because you need saving from your sin and so what you do is you repent you confess you be baptized into Jesus Christ, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we see the church started exploding that day, over 3,000 people that day. Soon after that, there were over 5,000. The church was, was blossoming. But it was doing this under a midst of, of tremendous fear, tremendous persecution. It wasn't long after that, Peter and John were arrested as they entered the temple. They were preaching about Jesus. They'd healed a man who was lame, and they arrested him, took him in, and said, don't you dare preach in this name anymore. So they walked out. They told the rest of the ch Christians, guess what they did to us? They arrested us. They took us in. They stuck us before the Sanhedrin, and they warned us, don't ever speak in this name again or else. And what, you remember what they did? They went to prayer and said, oh, God, give us boldness to speak. Give us boldness. To even though they warned us not to, even though they threatened us, give us boldness and give us courage. That was the conviction of the people. I love that prayer because they did not pray for protection. They did not pray for ease. They did not pray not to go to jail. They did not pray not to be flogged. They didn't pray for those things. They prayed... Give us courage and give us boldness to speak your truth. 
We didn't even talk about Ananias and Sapphira. You may remember that story, Ananias and Sapphira. Everybody was in Jerusalem. Everybody was having some economic trouble because they traveled from long distances, and then they found Christ, and they didn't want to leave. So they all stayed here without jobs. How long could you guys last without your jobs? If you want vacation, just say, hey, I'll, I'll just stay here. That'd be nice, depending on where you went for vacation. But they stayed. And so all the Christians started selling their stuff and combining it to support each other. And some people, like Barnabas, sold his lands and took all the profits, all the equity he received in his land, and gave it to the church. A couple other people wanted to do that. And I and Sapphira, they wanted to look like Barnabas. They just didn't want to do like Barnabas. So they sold their property, put some of it in their pocket, and took the rest of the church and says, here's everything we got. Just don't look in my pocket. Here's everything we got. And you know what happened to them? God killed them. In the manuals I've read on church growth, they don't ever address that issue. They, 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 they just assume that God's not going to kill us. That's not the way to grow a church. Don't you want to say, God, what? stop, wait a minute. You don't kill your people because they mess up. But that's what God did. And the Bible says that that church continued with great fear. Can you imagine? How many of us would survive this morning if God killed us because we sinned? <laughs> Whew. But why did he kill Ananias and Sapphira? He was trying to show us something powerful. He says, you don't lie to the Holy Spirit. You come to me and you be honest. You lay your life down here. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And it's not about you, it's about me. And when you try to make a name for yourself, you are on the wrong train. You need to focus on Jesus Christ. And those people did. And did it slow the growth of that church? Not a bit. People said, this God is real. This God is holding me accountable. This God is expecting of me, and this God is living with me, and this God is no different th today than he was then. And he's holding us accountable, and sin is wrong. And he wants us to come and confess our sin, not try to cover it up, and not try to look better than we are. But together, humbly admit, we're lost without Christ. And so the church continued to grow, and the apostles continued to speak and to, to do amazing works as they prayed, God, heal people, work through us by your power, not our own. And God did, and people started flocking to this church. And then we see that the leaders of the Jewish nation just couldn't handle that. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 5, verse 17, and read with me. What happened? The apostles are working. The church is growing. They're meeting in the temple. They're having a great time realizing the power of God in their lives. Verse 17. Luke writes, for he says, the high priest and his associates, who are members of the party of the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. They thought this life is all you get. And so you got to get all you can. And they loved the power, and they loved the money, and they loved the prestige. And the apostles were threatening that. So the members of the party of the Sadducees, they were filled with jealousy. And they arrested the apostles and they put them in public jail. Public jail. They wanted everybody to see these guys. They wanted everybody to see how foolish these people were for going against the Sadducees, against the rulers. What they didn't realize is that it backfired on them. And the people watched these other people who were willing to go to prison for their faith. And they said, I want that. I want something that's real. I want something that's powerful. I want something that people will stand up for. I want to, I want to follow something that people are willing to go to jail for. Because they believe it so much. But leaders didn't like Jesus' definition of leadership. His definition of leadership was the one who serves is the one who's greatest. 
The one who's least of all is the one who's best. The one who gives to other people is the one who is honored in God's sight. The leaders of the Jews didn't like that. They didn't want to follow Jesus. We see they got thrown in prison into jail. In verse 19, we pick up, it says, During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. He said this to them. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. And at daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. Okay, I want you to just try to imagine. Put yourself in their place for just a moment. You've been arrested. You're in jail. They threw them in jail because they didn't meet till the next morning. So they threw them in jail. They're sitting in jail at night because they spoke the word of God in public. The angel comes to them, opens the door, and he says, go and speak the word of God in public. Can't you see yourself going, but that's what got me here in the first place. What? Wait a minute. What are you telling me to do, angel? Wouldn't the wise thing be to go hide out and kind of get this guerrilla warfare underneath and we'll, we'll spread the news in secret and we'll We'll go underground now. And he said, no, stand up and speak it boldly in the open. And they obeyed. They said, okay. And I have to stop and ask myself, how many times has God told me to do that? To boldly speak his word, to speak his name in the open. Has he told you that? Have you ever felt that in your heart? I should say something. I should, I should, I should, and, and we think, I should, I should, but it's easy to go, no, that's it's not the right time. It's not the right place. It might be taken wrong. If I could just get away, you know, in a silent place with this one person and have an intimate conversation, maybe that would work, but this is, in public, is, it's not the right place. Have you ever felt that? I have. I told somebody I wanted the gift of prophecy to to just speak the word of God. And he said, be careful. Because if God gives you that gift, he will expect you to use it in the most inopportune times, in the most awkward of situations, and you will have to do it. Well, he's given us all that gift and all that command to speak. And sometimes it's in the boldest or most inopportune times where we have to be bold. And we have to be trusting and obeying. And this is what the disciples did. They obeyed. They went back to the temple and spoke. And look what happens. I I love this part of the story. I love a, a little twist on the story. Verse 21, he says, When the high priest and his associates arrived that next morning, they called together the Sanhedrin, the the leadership, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to the jail for the apostles. They called everybody in. Okay, guys, we got a big deal going on. we got to decide this. And they go to the jail. But arriving at the jail, <laughs> the officers didn't, officers didn't find them there. So they went back and reported, we found that the jails were securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, We found no one inside. On hearing this, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss. I bet they were. Wondering, what might this lead to? I can just see it. Can't you see them scratching their heads going, what? They they were here. Which way did they go? Which way did they go? And the guards are standing at the door going, we don't know. We didn't see them. The door's locked. It's just funny to me. And then, verse 25, someone came and said, Hey, look, the men you put in jail, they're standing in the temple courts teaching the people. And at that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force, though, because they feared that the people would stone them. And I want to just encourage us. There is power in people. There is power in a group. 
There is good power and there's bad power. There's mob mentality, which is dangerous. But when people stand up for what's right, a difference can be made. They were afraid of the people. There is power to the people. There's power in the people. There's power in the church. When we stand up and we speak, and we say this is right and this is wrong, not according to my standards, but according to God's standards, and we point back to him. And they treated the apostles differently because of the people. We have influence today. When we gather together, when we combine our strengths and we work together, we have that same influence. Verse 27, he says the apostles were brought in. And they're made to appear, appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders, he said, not to teach in this name. But you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. <laughs> and you're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Don't you want to kind of scratch your head a little bit? And you want to say, but you are guilty. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean we're trying to make you? Don't you remember? You were the guys who called for his death. You were the guys who went to the garden. You are the guys who arrested him. You are the guys who beat him. You are the guys who tried him. You are the guys who turned him over to Pilate. You are the guys who, when Pilate wanted to release him, demanded that he be killed. You are the ones. What do you mean we're trying to make you guilty of his blood? But don't people in power try to do that? Sometimes we do that. We try to say, well, it's not really my fault. I had something else in mind. That wasn't my intent. That's what, And we start making all kinds of excuses. But God calls us to follow and to obey. And that's what's so amazing about these apostles. They did that. They went back to the temple courts. They stood there in the public in the danger. And they gave themselves trusting into God's hands that he would provide for them. And guess what happened? They got arrested again. And now they're drug in here, and, and they're, these guys are furious at them. Look, Peter responds to them. He says, we must obey God rather than human beings. Verse 30, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Do you remember that? These guys were not powerful men. They didn't hold positions of authority or respect. The leaders could hang them high if they wanted to. And they say, you guys did this. I pray for boldness. For the church today to speak. This church continued to explode in a sense and a situation of real fear. There was real danger. But they were focused on obeying God and standing up for him. And the church continued to grow. But verse 31, Peter continues, he says, God exalted him, this one that you killed on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is who? The Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who do what? Obey Him. I talked, if you open your Bibles, you look at the first page of the book of Acts, it usually says Acts of the Apostles. And I, I don't know who came up with that title. But the apostles were nothing if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit working in them. The church today is nothing if it's not for the power of the Spirit working in us. And our obedience and willing to follow that. And Peter stands here and says, it is the Holy Spirit who's a witness. And God gives the Holy Spirit to whom? Those who obey. Were they obeying? They went back to the temple courts to speak boldly in the face of persecution in the face of threats by a real powerful government who could carry those out. And yet they said, we're going to trust God instead of man. And we'll speak God's words instead of man's words. 
Well, when they heard that, verse 33, when they heard this, they were furious and they wanted to put them to death. Can't you see them chomping at the bit? I, I bet they were spitting. I bet they were throwing things in there. I, 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 I want to be a fly on the wall in that group. I want to see what's going on. Gamaliel, now, who is a teacher of the law, he's a lost professor. He stands up and he says, guys, wait a minute. Before you kill them, let's talk. Let's put these guys out of the room and let's just kind of cool our heads down and think about this for a minute. And Gamaliel says this. He says, men of Israel, verse 35, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared. Thutis was a Messiah figure. He claimed to be somebody great. And people followed him. And he says, remember Thutis? He appeared claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him. But he was killed. And all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. Verse 37, you remember after him? Judas came along, the Galilean. He appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed. And all his followers were scattered. Verse 38. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will what? But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. This is unstoppable if it is from God. And you will only find yourselves fighting against God. Okay, brothers and sisters. If it is of men, it will fail. Here's the situation of the church in the United States today. There are some churches that are growing. But across Christianity in the United States is on a... On a on a decline. It is not standing. It is not influencing. It is not being powerful for God's sake. The church is being influenced by the world instead of the church influencing the world. And I've got to ask why. Whose fault is that? Did God just say, well, I'm tired of you guys. I'm going to go work somewhere else. Hmm? Or has the church become a work of men instead of a work of God? Do we look drastically different than the rest of the world? Or has the world crept in among us so that we look just like the rest of the world? Jesus says, when you're friends of the world, you're, you're an enemy of mine. He says, if you don't stand up and be different for my sake, you are lukewarm and I'll just spit you out of my mouth. Jesus makes a lot of claims about people who don't really trust in him. People who want to follow him. Ananias and Sapphira were not interested in following God. They were interested in being like the world and having people like them. And God killed them at church. What if he did that today? Where would I be? I've got to stop looking at, start looking at myself really close. What are my values? What do I really believe? Do I seek him first? Or do I seek everything else first? Or is he just part of my life? Or is he my life? I believe that the church grew not because the apostles made God a part of their life or they got God in their life. I believe the church grew because God got them. And he lived in them. And they said, like Paul in Galatians, I've been crucified. I don't live anymore. It's God who lives through me. I have died to myself. And I've turned it over to him. And I'm speaking words here that scare me to death. Because you know what it means? For me, it means change. And I'm comfortable. 
Anybody comfortable in your, their, your lifestyle, what you're doing? Most of us are. If we're not comfortable, we tend to change. But he's asked me to change out of my comfort. And to do something different. He said, if, you, if this church, if this Christianity is a work of man, it will fail. And in the United States today, it is failing. But if it's a work of God, you will not be able to stop it. It will be stronger than a freight train running away. It will be unstoppable. And so the, they took the disciples apart. They flogged them. They beat them with whips. And they ordered them not to speak in this name anymore. And they went out rejoicing. They went out rejoicing because they had been kind of worthy to suffer for the sake of Christ. These guys never stopped. It was verse 42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. There was nothing that got in their way. They were single focused. They said, there is one thing. We are on a mission from God to be his people, to be his ambassadors, to do it his way. And I'll tell you what. I have a hard time making small talk. I'm, I'm not a good conversationalist when it comes to sports. I, I just don't know the teams. I don't know. It takes too much time for me. And maybe I should be better at that because I could relate to people better. There are a lot of things that I just don't know. I, but, but if we can talk about the Bible, and how many of us would be that way? I can talk to you about God all day long. Let's talk about him. Let's talk about what he's done. Because here is the one thing that matters in life. Here's the one thing that will never die. Here's the one thing that every one of us will stand before God someday and say, yes, you are Lord. Whether we say it with joy or we say it with regret. The apostles, they give us a picture of this unstoppable force. And the Spirit is no less powerful today. He works through people who obey. He works through people who follow His power. So I'm going to pray. I want you to pray with me. And as we've already done, I want us to take a moment to be silent first. I can't speak to every situation in this room. But you can speak to your own. You know where your life is. God is calling us to be completely sold out for him. And you know the things that are holding you back. The things that are maybe being a, a distraction to you. And sometimes the hard choices are between good things. It might not always be something that's bad that's holding you back. It might be a, just so many good things. There's nothing wrong with knowing baseball stats and players. There's nothing bad about that unless it becomes a distraction. There's nothing wrong with running a business and supplying work for other people and, and money that you can use to give. There's nothing wrong with that unless it becomes a distraction from what's really important. You know those things in your life that might be a distraction. It's keeping you from being the person God has called you to be. Take some time and lay that before God while we pray. Father, you know. You know our lives inside and out. And we trust, Father, in your grace and your mercy. But Father, please don't ever let us take that for granted. You called us to obey. 
And you've said that you will work through us according to the power of your spirit that can accomplish incredibly more than we can ask or imagine. And Father, we trust that you can do that today. Increase our faith. But Father, as we lay these things before you, there are distractions in our lives. There are fears in our lives. <clears throat> and we want to lay these before you. We want to be your people. God, we want to be your salt. We want to be your light. Father, hear our prayers. There are comforts in our lives we don't want to leave behind. There are fears of how we'll be perceived. It's a fear of loss, of relationships, of friends, of possessions, of time. the fear of stepping out in something that we're uncomfortable with. So God, we pray for you to be our strength. Fill us with your spirit. Father, your, your spirit is unstoppable. Even today, in this country, in this county, in this city, and that's each of our homes, Father. God, we lay our lives before you because we realize that this world is not about us. You have purchased us with your blood. You paid the price for us to give us hope. And you've sent your spirit to live in us. Father, we confess to you that we do not belong to ourselves. We are yours. And you are Lord. And we follow you. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to sing a song that says, I am mine no more. I don't belong to myself anymore. I've been bought with blood. Roy, thank you. Thank you for sharing that memory, being vulnerable to us to share the intimacy of preparing that communion and realizing that blood and that body is not just cracker and juice. It represents a real God who died on the cross for us. What do we do with that? We were purchased with that blood. We were saved for eternal life. We are saved from the power of sin over us. What do we do with that? We thank God and we give our lives back to him, don't we? That's the only sensible thing to do. So we're going to stand in a moment and sing that song. And if you are ready to give your life to Christ, if you haven't, we have to say, come on down here. If there are things that you need to change and you need help, and we all need help, our elders are standing back here in the back saying, let's go to God and pray for his help. Let's call on the power that he makes available to us to be the people he's called us to be. So while we sing this song, this song of commitment, a song of statement saying, this is who I am. Make a choice. Make a choice to change for his sake. Let's stand. Let's sing.